Thank you. Please be seated. We are going on the record now in court file number 27CR186859, the state of Minnesota versus Mohammed Mohammed Noor. If parties could please state their appearances, starting with the counsel for the state. Good morning, Your Honor. Amy Sweezy and Patrick Lofton appearing for the state of Minnesota. Good morning, Your Honor. Thomas Plunkett, Peter B. Wold, and Aaron Morrison on behalf of Mohammed Noor, who is seated at council table. Your Honor, Stephanie Mackinson from probation. All right, thank you all. Um, we have a resentencing, obviously, to do this morning. Uh, I have received briefing from the defense and uh, I have read and reviewed that. My understanding is that there is some victim impact uh, this morning. And then I will hear from the parties about any argument about sentencing. And uh, then we will proceed from there. Uh, the uh, parties should come to the podium for any arguments. And Mr. Noor should come to the podium with his counsel for the sentencing. So, um, Ms. Sweezy, there's some victim impact. There is, Your Honor. May I approach? Yes. I have written copies of the victim impact statements for the court. Thank you. And then, Your Honor, um, I think the, the way that we will proceed is that Mr. Lofton and I will be reading statements from the Ruscheck family. Mr. Damon um, has elected to do his over the Zoom link that was provided, um, and we'll begin with the statements from the Ruscheck family. Um, the court probably will be interested to know that while it is one in the morning in Australia, the family um, has also joined us uh, by Zoom for this proceeding today, but have asked Mr. Lofton and I to read their statements. I'll begin with the statement of uh, Ms. Ruscheck's uh, parents, Mr. John Ruscheck and Ms. Marion Heffernan. This is the second time our family has had to experience the distress, trial, and injustice for the utterly gratuitous murder of Justine. Our original family victim impact statements remain the same. Our sorrow is forever. Our lives will always endure in emptiness and suffer the incomprehension of a loss of an innocent woman whom we will never be able to hug again. Before this killer is resentenced, we should refresh all our minds of the events of that night and the subsequent evidence exposed during the trial. In a simple sentence, Justine walked up to the side of a police squad car and was shot and killed. In plain language, police officer Mohammed Noor, while in the squad car, pulled out his weapon and shooting across his partner, shot and killed Justine without justification or pausing to think of his responsibilities and duties as a police officer. This is what happened. That should not have happened. During the trial, the jury heard testimony that described the event and subsequent behavior of the police officers involved. The jury, after hearing from the witnesses, the prosecution, the defense, and the court, returned a verdict of guilty of third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. This resentencing hearing may be the result of a poorly written law, but it cannot change the jury's belief that the then officer, Mohammed Noor, committed murder. Their verdict made clear that they believed the killing of Justine was an extremely serious offense and that Mohammed Noor should feel the weight of the community's distress and its desire for justice and police accountability. The verdict required the court to impose an appropriate sentence. It sent Mohammed Noor to prison for 12 and a half years. That sentence was not the harshest it could have been, but the court reasoned that Officer Mohammed Noor's act required a significant term of imprisonment. The facts of that night and those exposed during the trial are unaltered. Mohammed Noor remains guilty of killing Justine. Mohammed Noor was sent to prison for his criminal act. In our opinion, he should stay longer in prison than the 12 and a half years. Since that will not happen, we believe that he should serve the sentence that comes as close as possible to the one first imposed upon him. The maximum term of 57 months is the proper outcome of this resentencing hearing. We should expect complete accountability from our public institutions and their staff. 
when a crime against the public, such as killing Justine, which is so clearly outside of any normal and expected behavior is committed, we the jury and the community ask that justice be meted out honestly and justly concerning the gross insult to decent civilized standards. The hoped for goals are punishment for the guilty and also after reflection by police officers on this terrible occurrence, prevention of killings of innocent citizens in the future and resultant changes in their institutional culture and behavior. We have always sought accountability and justice for the killing of Justine. Justine. The penalty of 57 months sends a message to Mohammed Noor and other police officers to whom we entrust our safety and welfare that we require their respect for their badges, an awareness of their obligation to serve and protect all, and an acceptance of the rule of law. The disrespect shown to this principle of the sanctity of life, of Justine's life, already underscored by this criminal act will be exacerbated by the imposition of a trivial sentence. We will be outraged if the court is unwilling to accept the will of the people and demand that justice be heard, be seen, and be done. May I approach your honor? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be reading the statement of uh, Katerina Ruschek, Justine's sister-in-law. Thank you to the court and Judge Quaintance for the opportunity to speak today. I feel tired, I feel betrayed, and I feel angry at how this process has ended. Having sat in the courtroom for weeks, listening to defense twist the facts to suit a particular narrative, being so careful not to say anything to the media so as not to jeopardize the outcome of the legal process we so fully put our trust and hope in, being quiet and patient and calm in the storm of grief and sadness it made me just want to scream at the injustice of what we had experienced. And all of that playing out in the media day after day, when we just wanted to be private and quiet and process what was happening. So having the Supreme Court overturn the decisions of the trial judge and the appeal appeals court is so very disappointing and totally confounding, to be honest. As an attorney myself, I know that there are facts and then there is truth. But in my opinion, the outcome of this trial has been decided on the facts as they were presented, but not the truth. We saw from that the first day we found out that this man had shot and killed my sister-in-law. The blue wall of silence that formed around him was and still is very real. We experienced that firsthand. Because for so long, the facts we were given just did not add up. We just couldn't make sense of what happened. It just didn't seem possible that our Juzzy had been killed. But I know there are facts, then there is truth. The truth is my sister-in-law was a helpful, caring citizen. The truth is she called for the police for help for that night. The truth is Noor saw a person and intended to shoot that person. He fired his gun in the face of his partner inside a squad car and that he killed our Juzzy. The sad truth is that in your country, there is not a category of murder that captures this exact scenario, even when someone intends to kill a person and does in this scenario. But in my mind and in the minds of the jury that sat through the hearing of all of the evidence, what happened to Justine is murder. But we accept and will learn to uh, live with the Supreme Court's decision. The killer, Noor, might be getting out sooner than we had hoped, but he will always be a murderer in my mind. He took our precious Justine away from us. He took a loving sister away from my husband, a devoted aunt away from my children, and the opportunity for me to grow and be a better and sister better sister-in-law to her. He extinguished the brightest star, the most sparkly, beautiful, creative, and caring person when he killed our Juzzy. I'm sure she is transcending above all of this on a higher plane, vibing at the brightest frequency. He gave her friends and family a life sentence of endless pain with a life lived without her sparkly soul. But he will always have the knowledge for the rest of his life that what he did was take the life of an innocent person and I hope he learns from that. I hope he doesn't perpetuate the misguided myth that he was actually in the right and that he got caught up in the moment. That is just a collection of erroneous facts rubbed together by his team of lawyers. There is no truth to that interpretation of the facts. No, this is a legal loophole situation, not one of moral triumph. There are no lessons to learn 
if he continues to have his ego stroked by the culture of police in this state that continue to live under the protection of the blue wall of silence and a culture of killing first and refusing to ask questions later. The truth is there is a problem with fear in the Minneapolis police, a culture of macho protectionism of their own rather than protecting the people they are supposed to serve. There will be no systemic changes if people like Noor continue to allow to be police, handed a gun, and are out in the community taught by their superiors how to be trigger happy and get away with it. The truth is there is no justice for Justine, not unless the police culture changes and the community is safe, not only from those elements of society that seek to harm them, but from the institution that is supposed to protect them. But that is not today. The second statement I'll read your honors from Jason Ruschek, and that's Justine's brother. My sister's death, caused through the actions of Muhammad Noor, has changed my life, the lives of my family, and the lives of those who loved or knew her forever. Memories of that day, the lead up to the trial, and then of the trial itself are often the last things I think of before I sleep and the first things I think of when I awake. Every day I say to myself, every day I need to learn to live with it. Only with the love for my sister and knowledge of her kindness and compassion in my heart can I do this. I will always believe that the decision of the jury and judge acquaintance at the end of this trial was the correct one. And I will hold that close to me as well as that was justice for my sister. I have heard that a wishing tree has grown out of the ground near the memorial bench Don erected for her near the creek. What a wonderful thing. I wish I had my sister back. I wish for my sister to be back on this earth, for her bare feet to feel the soil and her smile to breathe the clean, fresh air. I wish for my sister and me to sit in a door blue on blue days we would cherish so much those crystal clear days where the blue ocean would compete against the blue sky for the serenity award. I wish for my sister's smile and her warm hugs to be a presence in my life till we, till we grow old and leave this earth on natural terms. I wish for her laughter to be present at family dinners. I wish Don a good life, free of pain from this trauma and a future full of love and peace. I wish for my children to have their aunt's love and tenderness in their lives. I wish for my father and Mem had their daughter back. If I return to Minneapolis, I will visit the tree. My sister is the best person I've ever known and I miss her terribly. Every day, she lives on in my heart and visits me with smiles in my dreams. That is my statement. Check family, and if this is the appropriate time for Mr. Damon um, to uh, turn on his camera and unmute and provide his statement, um, Don, you can go ahead. Mr. Damon reports that he is not hearing the courtroom audio. Welcome to Zoom for government. Please press 1 to join the meeting. You are in the meeting now.
Mr. Damon, can you hear us now? Looks like my camera is on. Yeah, it's good. Okay. All right, good morning. Uh, I want to first acknowledge Amy Sweezy and Patrick Lofton for your hard work and sound application of the law. The decision by the Minnesota Supreme Court, in my eyes, does not diminish the truth which was uncovered during the trial. The truth is that Justine should be alive. No amount of justification, embellishment, cover-up, dishonesty, or politics will ever change that truth. I also wish to acknowledge the Honorable Judge Quaintance for applying the law and honoring Justine and our families and providing as much privacy and dignity as you legally were allowed. Thank you for those respectful actions. Please don't read into my statement that I am not still grieving the loss of Justine. I still cry so often, and I miss her so deeply. I will always love her, and I am deeply guided by her in the following statement. In this world, we see so much division, so much hatred, murder, racism, sexism, black and white thinking, which only separates us as humans. In Justine's life, she was a unifier, not a separator. She lived with the highest level of morality of anyone I had the privilege of knowing. She stood for justice. She lived to transform people. She lived a life of love. She modeled a life of joy for all, and she stood for forgiveness. I watched as she generously forgave others for their injustices and poor behavior. She taught me and others that all people have value. She taught that all people deserve mercy and that all people can transform. And I have no doubt she would have forgiven you, Muhammad, for your inability to manage your own emotions that night, which resulted and you pulling that trigger. Justine was and is still my greatest teacher. Given her example, I want you to know that I forgive you, Muhammad. All I ask is 
that you use this experience to do good for other people. Be the example of how to transform beyond adversity. Be an example of honesty and contrition. This is what Justine would want. The greatest amends we can ever make is to change our behavior for the better. We can never undo the past. But our work is to heal by demonstrating we can truly change and do good for others. This is Justine's example in life. And now, even in death, she shows us how to live. Thank you. At this time, I will hear uh, from the uh, parties regarding um, disposition in this matter, uh, and we can start with the state. Thank you, Your Honor. One of the things that I've had to explain to the Damons and uh, Ruschek and Justine's family over the last several weeks is exactly where we are and what the options are that are available to the court. And um, I'll tell you what I, what I told them, and it's also for the benefit of the other spectators here in the courtroom, because I think there's a significant amount of confusion about what happens in a situation like this, which doesn't happen very often. But for those of us who know Minnesota sentencing law, it, it's, it's pretty easy to see what the, what the options are here for the court, but what they allow and what the Minnesota sentencing guidelines allow for a sentence for uh, Mr. Noor are a range of months between 41 and 57. And um, in our line of work, we speak about the top of the box and the bottom of the box and the middle of the box. And none of that matters when you're a family of someone who's lost someone. But what I have explained to, uh, to the family and what they understand and what you heard in the statements is that what, what they ask for and what we ask for, what Mr. Lofton and I ask for, are, is the sentence at what we call the top of the box, the 57 months. And this court can give a sentence between 41 months and 57 months without any explanation here today. There's no findings that need to be made. Any one of those numbers in between is within the discretion that's given to this court as the sentencing court, which is something that this court has that the appellate courts did not have. The sentencing decision um, is uniquely up to this court. And although I suspect the court, when it pronounces its sentence, will give reasons for doing it, um, you don't have to because any sentence that you give here today will be a guideline sentence. Um, and the fact is, is that some numbers are less than others, and I know that Mr. Plunkett is gonna ask you for a lower number, and we're asking for the higher one. Our reasons for asking for the number of 57 months and for that sentence, um, we believe that are, are several. One of them is that this case now stands alone among manslaughter cases in the state of Minnesota, second degree manslaughter cases in, the Minis in Minnesota, on its facts. This will be the only time that a police officer has been sentenced for a crime under this offense in the state of Minnesota. And also, for those of us who practice in the area, we refer to things that are worse than typical or more serious than typical which is always awkward when you're talking about the loss of a human life in a serious criminal offense, but nonetheless, that's, that's how we do our work. And by every measure, the facts of this case, what the jury heard, what was decided by the jury is worse than typical for a second degree manslaughter case, all of which are very, very serious. 
One of the reasons that this case is more serious than others is because of the fact of who the defendant was at the time. He wore the badge of a Minneapolis police officer voluntarily and by his own statement uh, with pride. That was something that he wanted to do, a, a job that he chose. And we learned during the trial, particularly from Chief uh, Tim Longo from the University of Virginia, we learned about the social contract that exists when someone puts on that badge and what they have agreed to do. And that social contract provides to officers a privilege and rights uh, to use deadly force to protect other civilians. And that is a privilege afforded to no other member of society in the United States. And the defendant had that privilege. The other side of that social contract belongs to the citizens. The citizens agree not to take matters into their own hands and that when they see something dangerous or when they need help, that they will reach out to the police to get the help that they need. And we exist side by side that way. We have officers who carry guns and we trust that they will be used only when necessary to protect other people from harm. In Ms. Ruschek's case, she was acting perfectly consistent with everything we know about her character, not even for herself when she called 911. She was calling to protect a third party, a woman in the alley who was suffering some kind of harm. She followed through with her end of the deal. She called 911 a second time. She went out to greet the police. She went out to tell them what she knew to try to help. And it was the defendant who breached that social contract. Instead of using his authority and his power to protect, to investigate, to prevent further harm, he pulled that weapon and used it in a misguided belief of his own defense. This case stands unique on its facts for that. And for that, the most serious sentence this court can impose is required. I'd like to speak also today about what we heard at trial. And this court's sentencing decision needs to be based on what we heard back in 2019, two, year, two and a half years ago when we tried this case, about the events that occurred two years before that in 2017. And Your Honor, the evidence that you heard and what was proven here, and um, it's important to mention, I think, that the jury's verdict on the third degree murder count, for the Supreme Court to have reversed that, required them to overrule the precedent expressly on which the charging decision in this case, on which this court's pre-trial, during trial, and post-trial motions rested, and the law on which the Minnesota Court of Appeals made its decision. Nothing can be done about that, but it doesn't change the fact that this jury told us that what Mohammed Noor did was worse than second degree manslaughter. They had a choice between both, and they found him guilty of that, of both. From that, we should draw a, a strong conclusion that the members of this community found Mr. Noor's conduct to be extremely, extremely serious. I would point out also that while Mr. Noor may have conceded his guilt on this offense of second degree manslaughter to the reviewing courts, to both the Minnesota Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, he did not do that at trial. What he did was mount, uh, which he is perfectly entitled to do, an extremely vigorous and aggressive defense, pointing out a number of things um, that I would consider that we, that we have called the sort of yes but things things that meant to shift responsibility to Ms. Ruschek for her, for her own death. Things like, yes, but Ms. Ruschek st should have stayed in the house and listened to her fiance who told her to go outside. Ms. Ruschek had skills as a, uh, as a person who practiced yoga that allowed her to sneak up on the car, thus causing some kind of un unbelievable fear in the part of the defendant and his partner. The fact that uh, what was expressly found by the Minnesota Supreme Court is a matter of fact, that they credited what happened at this trial with the belief that Ms. Ruschek never slapped that squad car, that that actually was disproven at trial, and that she did nothing to bring about the circumstances of her own death. 
and this court sending a message through the sentence uh, of that will go a long way to recognizing who is responsible for this and, and who isn't. I want to also recognize publicly the Ruscheck families and Don Damon's family, and I want to thank them publicly. This has been an incredibly long four-year journey for them. They have been um, all... All victim families, particularly in homicides, carry a unique burden in our society, and they have to put their trust in a government institution for the resolution of their cases. And even in a case like this, which brought about you know, extreme distrust in the system, um, the Ruscheks and Mr. Damon and his family have stepped up every time and done everything we asked them to. And it has been my observation that they have really tried to convey to this court the importance of this, but also a larger view of what this case meant, not only um, in Minneapolis, but elsewhere in the country. And I think it's important that, that they know how much Mr. Lofton and our team appreciate that. And they're continuing to stick with us when many other people would have had every reason not to. So, Your Honor, those are the reasons uh, that we would ask you to sentence, obviously, within the Minnesota sentencing guidelines, but a sentence of 57 months, which at this point um, is, is the way that the court is able to use its discretion and its power to recognize this and ensure that justice is served in the case. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sweezy. Mr. Plunkett? Thank you and good morning, Your Honor. July 15th, 2017, the Twin Cities has seen so many adjustments since the day of the events that bring us together unfolded. On July 15th, 2017, so many lives changed in a blink of an eye. Two young officers, both early in their careers, both overreacted, and Mr. Noor's overreaction caused the tragic death of Ms. Ruschik. This perfect storm came and went in under a second. We are now here to sentence Mr. Noor because his mistake constitutes a culpably negligent act. In considering the right sentence, we respectfully ask this court to consider who Mr. Noor is beyond the act he committed that led to the death of a wonderful person. From the earliest moments of this case, there has been tremendous focus on who Ms. Ruschik was, her unfailing kindness to animals, to children, and to all people, all of it very true, and adding to the depth of this tragedy. Another aspect of the tragedy of this case is the similar goodness that inheres in Mr. Noor. Both of these people took a similar and profound interest in those around them. They wanted to make the world a better place for others. Throughout his life and up to this very day, Mr. Noor has worked with one measure of personal achievement. And that measure is how he has helped the people around him. Even when he shot and killed Ms. Ruschek through culpable negligence, he was operating with a mistaken belief that he needed to protect his partner. A horrible mistake to be sure, but not an act motivated by cruelty or distaste for human life. Mr. Noor chose a career in police work to bridge the frayed relationship between the police, the justice system, and the Somali immigrant community. His was not an obvious career choice for a college-educated man with so many options before him. He just wanted to help his community, 
to help the citizens of Minneapolis. Having come from nothing, having arrived in America with so little, only the clothes on his back and a suitcase in his hand, he had now received so much that he had to give back. Mr. Neuer grew up watching his father work hard, and he'd seen his father's work be rewarded with a chance in America. The chance to allow his family to prosper. The chance to be educated. The chance to succeed, and all in exchange for perseverance and hard work. Seeing that, Mr. Noor wanted to give back and repay the opportunities he and his whole family have received. Mr. Noor has two matters that are most important to him, family and community. This is witnessed by his conduct while incarcerated. He worked to make his prison a better place. He wasn't simply a model prisoner, he was an award-winning prisoner. He was selected to receive the Prisoner's September 11th Worker Award, recognizing Mr. Noor's commitment to his job and respect for others. Your Honor, we are respectfully asking this court to impose a sentence at the low end of the guideline range. We understand that this would be a different approach than the court took in 2019, but we are here for sentencing in a different time. And there can be little doubt that Mr. Noor's time in incarceration has been more punitive than anyone could have imagined before the pandemic. That sentence will sanction Mr. Noor for his tragic mistake, recognize his dedication to the community, account for the harshness of his incarceration, and make a step toward restoring trust in our justice system to the Somali community. That sentence can be justice. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything further from either side? Your Honor, at this time, Mr. Gore would like to address the court. Your Honor, I just want to say that I'm deeply grateful for Mr. Damon's forgiveness. I'm deeply sorry for the pain that I've caused that family, and I will take his advice and be a unifier. Thank you. The court want us to be seated. Uh, there you are. Mr. Noor, I last saw you on July 7th, 2019, two years, three and a half months ago, and certainly much has changed in the world since then. But I need to read a portion of what I said on that day, because the jurors in this case, citizens of Minneapolis, raised questions then that remain unanswered. On July 7th, I said, the primary concern of the jurors who heard the testimony in this case when I spoke with them after the verdict was, will there be changes? Change is needed. Will some of these supervising officers be fired or disciplined? Is what we saw normal? for the Minneapolis Police Department and the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. How will this be prevented from happening again? Why are officers more concerned about their personal safety than the safety of the public, especially in such a low crime neighborhood? Why should a civilian have to be afraid of approaching a squad car? What about the motto on the car door, to serve with compassion? Why were Mr. Noor and Mr. Harity so reactive? What was their training? 
The jurors in this case were particularly concerned with Officer Harrity's statement that his priority was making sure he did whatever he had to to get home safe each night. Jurors remarked that they thought the priority of the police was supposed to be to protect and serve the public. No one who heard the testimony in this case or who works in the criminal justice system can question the difficulty of a patrol officer's job or the dedication of the majority of the police and first responders. But here, something went very much awry. The victim's family and some of the witnesses, including some officers, have expressed concerns. A large amount of taxpayer dollars will go to Australia, but Minneapolis residents await the promised transformation and the questions of the jurors remain unanswered. What has changed? What will change so that this does not happen again? How does the department address officer safety without jeopardizing public safety? The jurors and the people of Minneapolis need and deserve answers. The citizens of Minneapolis have now paid out $47 million in settlements for allegations of police negligence and malfeasance. Since we last met, another person has died at the hands of police after two other rookies responded together in a squad to a low-risk situation which escalated. The community exploded. Another police officer has been on trial for murder. Mr. Noor, I am not surprised that you have been a model prisoner. However, I do not know of any authority that would make that grounds for reducing your sentence. There was no departure motion in this case by either side, and so no departure from the guidelines is appropriate or legal. You have been convicted of manslaughter in the second degree, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk of harm. As Ms. Sweezy said, the court may sentence you to between 41 months and 57 months. That is the range. You did shoot across the nose of your partner. You did endanger a bicyclist and residents of a community of surrounding houses on a summer Saturday evening. One household was entertaining guests on a porch adjacent to the gunfire. These factors of endangering the public make your crime of manslaughter appropriate for a high end of the guidelines box. I hereby sentence you to the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 57 months. You will receive credit for the 908 days you have spent in custody. You have previously submitted DNA to the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension back in July of 2017. I hereby remand you to the custody of the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. Good luck, sir. Bye.